Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 230 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, February 14th, 2012. Nice to see you. I'm Robbie. And I'm Rachel. Hey, Ray. How are you all doing today? Like your hair? It's yeah. different. Something's different this week. Huh. Valentine's. Uh-huh. And what are you all doing watching the show instead of doing something for Valentine's? <laughs> Alrighty. Well, I will tell you what is coming up in the newsroom. We have Apple stock price has surpassed $500 a share. So I hope you have some stocks in that. And uh, Netflix has paid $9 million to settle a privacy-related legal action. And President Obama plans to halt Mars exploration in favor of human spaceflight. When I first read that, I thought it said in favor of human sacrifice. (laughs) So it's a good... (laughs) I don't know. Whoops. Uh, the Microsoft India web store has been hacked and user passwords were stolen. So stick around. These stories are coming up later in the show. Scary stuff. Scary mm-hmm. stuff. I feel like you're like uber short tonight. Is your chair low? Double, just, yeah, kind of like, uh, well, maybe it's, maybe I'm just so, t- there, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. You've done it. Well, tonight we are going to be, uh, we're going to be building the ultimate virtual box setup. You want to stick around? That seems a little bit more, more realistic. There we go. Mm-hmm. My kids were sitting on that chair, I believe, so it kind of they sunk it down. Typing away on Super Tux. My daughter is like in love with Super Tux right now. They both, both Tally and Zach, they draw pictures of Super Tux. They love it. If you haven't got it for your kids, make sure you go get it. Awesome. So, um, one of the most important issues that have come up this week is Jiminy Cricket is paying a visit to Rob. <laughs> He's like, his conscience. Robbie, <laughs> yes, you've gotten Christy Donuts, Christy Pizza, and last week... Krista. Krista. Yeah. Christy. Last week, Eric got cherry pie, so I've heard. What is this? Yeah, and then here we are, me, nothing. Sorry. <laughs> well, but it is Valentine's Day, and you know, I just couldn't... Oh, I just couldn't watch you suffer. Uh, I got wow. you a Valentine's <laughs> cake. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. I would send you one as well. It's I can smell it from here. It smells delicious. Pure chocolate goodness. No sharing. Eat up. You won't get any. Eat up. Hey, you can visit our mobile site. It's cat5.tv slash uh, mobile or as it says on the screen, as I realized that it also has a redirect, mobile.cat5.tv. That would be the way to get there. Uh, or you can scan this QR code. Very cool way to get it. Bring up your device, scan that code, and boom, it comes up on your screen. Mobile.cat5.tv. Also, uh, we would love to receive your postcard. All you have to do is send it to Category 5 Technology TV, P.O. Box 29009, Barrie, Ontario. That's Canada, L4N7W7. And, of course, when you send us your postcard, we will show it on air. We'd love to uh, see where you're from. Maybe a picture of a local, uh, uh, something that's scenic, uh, maybe a tourist attraction or something that we'd be interested in. That would be very cool. So, um, I don't know if you know this, but Robbie's working on his website. Mm. And they have a cool new feature. I've been allowed to peek at it, where any postcard that's been sent in is put on like a viewer map kind of like who's watching yeah, it's similar right eh? mm-hmm. yeah and you click on it and you can see what the postcard said and you get a picture of the front of the postcard so you get to see where around the world they've been sent from so that should be cool so send in thousands of them so rob postcards spends from all over all week having to upload these and just make them do more work it's gonna be very cool if you send in a postcard it's actually going to make itself uh onto that map you'll see a pin and you click on it as rachel's saying so 
There's some really cool features coming up on the new Mm -hmm. site. I'm so excited about it. It is going to be going into phase one beta very soon. We've got a a great team of of people, uh, viewers especially, who are going to be testing the site for us. If you're interested in that, all you have to do to get involved in the beta, it's a closed beta. It is uh, open to everyone, but you have to sign up for it. So all you have to do is email live at category5.tv. Make sure in the subject line you say V3 beta or beta, depending on where you're from. But that will get you involved. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a, an awesome uh, upgrade to our website. So very excited about that. Yep. It'll be much easier to watch episodes and everything, too. Yeah, it's you've laid kind of out. navigated around yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's laid out a lot nicer, and it's got a big launch button and everything to make it easy. One of the things that I've really worked towards, I, I, I don't know if, if people really realize how, how resource-intensive running a show like this on a website is when it's a very specific window. You know, Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock is when we're live. So our servers get hit really, really hard during that time. And so one of the things that we're working on and what I'm working on is building this new site to be extremely lightweight. And that means it's going to be very, very zippy when you bring up the website. It's going to load very quickly. Uh, We're going to see those errors that you sometimes get on our website when there's too much traffic. Uh, Those are going to disappear as well. So we're very, very excited about it. Cool. A uh, question in the chat room from Ignacio82 says, quick question, I've got a Logitech C910 running in Ubuntu. The problem is that the maximum resolution that I can select is 640 by 360. Any idea why I can't set it to 720? That, oh, that's going to be like a, a video for Linux issue, but you would think that if you bring up Cheese, it's going to allow you to, to set that. Have you used Cheese to, to test that? Be interested to know. Cheese allows you to just kind of use a drop down and and uh, pull it down. Uh, but you have, eh? Cheese. She's like <laughs> cheese. That sounds cheesy. It's cheese, like a camera, you know. And like say cheese. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. It makes sense. So uh, that unfortunately, I don't have uh, one of those cameras, um, so I, I can't test for you. It's going to be a trial and error. But I'm sure that there are some forums that may be able to help you. Um, certainly for your particular distribution, if you're using Ubuntu, for example, get over to Ubuntu forums and see if anyone out there uh, has experienced the same issue. That would be my best recommendation at this point. Now, one of the things that I'm really working toward with Category 5, especially if you can believe that we're coming up on our fifth anniversary, so as we move into Season 6 this fall, uh, I'm very excited that we're going to be putting more of a push toward uh, Linux compatibility as far as hardware goes and things like that. So we're going to see more and more of that but unfortunately you know it's getting to that place where we've got hardware to test with Um, so love to know if you find a resource that helps you fix that Um, but unfortunately my knowledge as far as that camera goes is not gonna help you tonight so cheers for the question anyways cool so we've got to uh, get a word from our sponsor and uh, we will be right back uh, in just a moment after this Your last chance to relax is on the way up the hill. With Liquid Image Canada, you can capture all the action like never before without a bulky sports cam. That's a high-definition video camera mask from liquidimagecanada.com. Hands-free HD video recording of all the excitement. Even in low light, you'll capture the memories just how you experienced them. The Summit Series video camera masks in 720p or 1080p. Available now from liquidimagecanada.com. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and you find us online at www.category5.tv. Speaking uh, of... I look over. (laughs) You knew. You knew and you kept this a secret from me. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) gang. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about webcams in Linux and webcams in general. And one of the big exciting things uh, this week is that uh, Wirecast from Telestream, cat5.tv slash Wirecast. If you go to that link, you're going to see the software that we use to broadcast the show. It's called Telestream Wirecast, and with that software, we're able to connect all our cameras into one computer, and we can camera switch and do all that kind of stuff. So, interestingly enough, we've been waiting for it. Pleased to announce that uh, 4.1.3 has come out of Wirecast, and it is compatible with the Microsoft LifeCam Studio. This is a 1080p webcam, okay? HD webcam. 
It's in fact what we're using tonight, so I don't know if you noticed that we're using a new camera, but it's one of these, the uh, studio from Microsoft. So if you're watching and you're a Wirecast user, what we're doing tonight is actually broadcasting through the studio in Wirecast 4.1.3. And I kind of wanted to touch on it because I know that a lot of you are, are curious about what it would take to be able to broadcast your own show, or maybe you already broadcast a show and you really want to step it up to HD. Uh, well, here's an opportunity to do so uh, very cheaply. You can find out more about this actual webcam on our website, uh, actually on my blog. It's cat5.tv slash lifecam. And if you go to that website, you're going to learn a little bit more about the processes that we went through in order to get uh, this, ca this camera working uh, on Telestream Wirecast. But now that it's here, fantastic. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring up the, the GNU Image Manipulation Program. I want to show you just a quick little demonstration. And, you know, while I talk, I mean, you can, you can eat that, that cupcake thing. The that's, massive that's cupcake. <laughs> What I want to show you here, I'm just going to give you a quick demo of what is a little bit different here about the studio. So we were previously broadcasting in uh, 720p, so that's uh, 1280 by uh, 720 is the resolution of 720p. So essentially, you know, let's say that that is the size of our window. So I'm going to color that in black so that we have something to reference, okay? I'm going to create a new layer here in the GNU image manipulation program and I'm going to go and change the canvas size now proportionally to 1080p 1920 by 1080 so now you'll see that comparatively that's the amount of camera data video data that we now have added to the video so th that black box is 720p the grid is in fact 1080p so check out what I'm going to show you. And this is something for Wirecast broadcasters, people who are considering using the uh, Microsoft LifeCam Studio. Because sometimes what we don't realize with a 1080p camera is th that we don't necessarily need to broadcast in 1080p. I'm going to show you what I mean in just a second here. I'm going to grab another color. I'm going to go green. And let's fill in that layer green. Okay? Not that layer. Haha. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Created the layer in the wrong order. There we go. Okay, so green is 1080p. Black is 720p. Watch what I can do with this black box. Okay. What I hope that you can understand is at 1080p, let's just say I've got, and Rachel's going to love this because I'm such an artist as far as this goes. We're going to go new layer. Okay. Here's a person. Okay. So that's, that's going to be you, Rachel. You're on camera. Here's, yes. here's me. Okay. Remember, we're at 1080p now with this camera. All right. So we're not actually broadcasting at 1080p. We're using a 1080p camera. So if you're interested in using what's called digital zoom, watch this. This is my 720p frame. Okay. So if I were using a 1080p camera, which allows me to see that entire space, but I were to broadcast in 720p, now I can zoom in digitally and I have lossless video all the way around this frame. So I can zoom in so that it's pretty much just Rachel, pretty much just me at 720p digitally and I don't need multiple cameras. I can move around the screen. So as you can see, here we are at, you know, we've got the 1080p camera, which has been scaled down to 720p. Here we've got 1080p zoomed in a little bit, and here again. So it's going to be lossless because we're able to actually move around without upscaling that video. So very cool to be able to do that. You can do that because we've got much more pixel data coming off of this camera. So. Very cool stuff. Now, with Wirecast 4.1.3, uh, 
Uh, and again, I encourage you to check out the website cat5.tv slash wirecast. This is a camera switching software, so it's what we use in order to actually create Category 5 TV from a technical standpoint. Cameras plug into that computer and it powers it. If you're going to use a 1080p camera like this, it does take a lot of power. We're using an i7 uh, 2600K with 8 gigs of RAM, no, 16 gigs of RAM, pardon me, and uh, it's a pretty powerful system. There's six hard drives and everything's in a RAID 0 and it's very powerful, but even with that hard drive setup, I still can't encode in 1080p directly to hard hard drive. So we can only encode in 720. So that's why you know we can we can compromise by using the camera in full 1080p and then zooming in on it, and it, we get lossless digital zoom, which is beautiful, beautiful thing for webcasting. So any questions, let us know in the chat room. Uh, Wirecast 4.1.3 now introducing the ability to uh, to use cameras such as the life cam studio very exciting so garby says robbie f when you switch it to zoom it also doesn't get heavily pixelated and then he's like yay well that's the thing i i hope that my my little demonstration using that graphic helps you to understand why that is because we're recording broadcasting in 720p so we can move around that 1080p space rather than taking a 720p camera and zooming in on it which stretches the image and we lose quality here we're able to move around the image without losing quality. So the question is, do you want full quality this close? Yes. Well, see, in our case, for example, we have a fairly limited space. I don't know if you can really get a sense. Here is the LifeCam studio, and we are, you know, we could not put cameras all around us because we've got monitors all around us. If you look here, this is this is our setup, right? So in that case, being able to use some form of digital zoom is really kind of critical. We need to be able to do that. So being able to do it losslessly with the LifeCam Studio and Wirecast, that's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Cool? Coolio, coolio. Yeah. Well, we've got a couple of viewer questions that we should probably jump into. We've got a lot going on tonight, and I'm very, very excited to be showing you uh, some stuff with VirtualBox. We're going to get really uh, under the hood, and we're not going to be looking at it from a, uh, as much an end user experience as a server administrator kind of experience. So stick around. We're going to be talking about that in a few minutes. All right. So we have something here from Robert Meineke. I hope I pronounced that hey, right. Hey, Robert. And um, he said, I popped into my mother's credit union the other day to mm -hmm. transact a bit of business. And much to my surprise, Eric Kidd's long lost twin was beaming at me from the board of directors gallery on the wall. And he has a link there. Best regards, Robert M. Does he mention where this is? Well, the link's, uh, can you bring it up on the screen oh, maybe? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So we can see we this go. Eric the Kidd The Education twin. Employee Credit Union. Oh my. <laughs> And there he is. That is uncanny. Could you imagine? <laughs> does he know of this twin? <laughs> I, I mean, he does now. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it does look just like him. That's the weird thing about having viewers all over the world is that, you know, you, you guys, to walk into a credit union and find a guy that looks just like one of our co-hosts, that's hilarious. Cool I hope Eric stuff. is watching because that is just crazy. I'm going to have to post the link in the show notes. <laughs> this credit union is going to be like, why did our why did our hits just go through the roof? <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody's hitting this guy's uh, page. So this uh, credit union is in Fresno, California. So Eric apparently uh, has a twin. Uh, what do you think? Does, does that look strikingly like Eric? Yeah, and it's even got the same it. <laughs> he. He. Yes. Dark hair. Gray. Same style going. Same style. Alrighty, and uh, interesting. Very cool. We have a uh, viewer question okay. from Jim Franklin, aka Old Guy Jim. Hey, so, Jim. Um, his question is, Robbie F., I've been a fan of stop-motion animation since I first watched King Kong and then Mighty Joe Young, and no, Old Guy Jim is not that old. I saw them as a kid on television. <laughs> I was were reruns. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated by your stop motion episode, Tribute to Star Trek. You showed the webcam you used to do the scene grabs. I've been looking for an mm -hmm. Ubuntu friendly webcam that can still be purchased <coughs> new. I've not had much pro success finding one with the necessary driver. If required, that works with my current version of Ubuntu and stop motion. 
Okay. Do you or anyone in the chat room have a suggestion as to what works? As usual, thanks to you and to your excellent co-host for a quality broadcast. Note my coworker guitar player two thousand also enjoys the broadcast. Cheers, old guy Jim. Awesome, thanks, Jim. So webcams and Linux. Um, now, okay, so we had in the chat room a little bit. It seems like the theme becomes webcams, and that's cool uh, because we just happen to switch webcams here. Uh, but we had a, a viewer in the chat room who was having trouble getting a particular camera working in Linux as, as far as getting it in its full 720p glory. Um, what I do have connected into this system, and uh, Jim, you're going to make me sound like I'm, I'm trying to sell Microsoft cameras, and I'm, and I'm not so much, but I want you to know that there are some good cameras out there that, are, that can be had for very, very cheap. Um, for example, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, Jim. I'm going to go cat5.tv slash lifecam. Okay, that's the uh, little blog entry that I have that's dedicated to this, you know, uh, getting this camera really working well. So I'm going to go there, and you'll see if you scroll down a little bit, you can go buy this camera here. So this is what I mean by this is ch cheap. So we're going to go here, and I'm going to go Life Cam Studio. Just a quick search. There it is. Okay, it currently is on sale, and you can have this camera. 1080p for $54.99, all right? So make sure you follow the link uh, through my blog at cat5.tv slash lifecam uh, because we do kind of keep track of uh, how many people click on that and it helps us out. Um, so it's a great price. Now I've got one connected to our demo system, fortunately. So I'm gonna bring up cheese so that Rachel can see what it is that we're talking about when we say cheese. There we go. Okay, so there's a LifeCam Studio. If I go Edit, Preferences, you'll see that by default it's coming in at 640 by 480, which is not widescreen. I would, I would want to go 640 by 360 instead so that it's widescreen mode, which is a bit nicer. Um, but, of course, you can go up to you know, the full resolution. I don't think this computer will be able to handle that resolution. I think it would be choppy, see? So if you get that, you can bring down the resolution, it means your computer can't handle that speed. Uh, 720p, it seems to do pretty good. And of course, you know, for webcam use or whatever else, 640 by 360, doesn't that, doesn't that look good, you know? Really, really good. Because you're still, you're still using the aperture and the, and the lens on a 1080p camera here, it's just that uh, you're, you're scaled it down to 640 by 360. So, let's close out of that. You said that you are interested in um, in doing some stop motion. So I'm going to bring up stop motion, which uh, I have installed from our demonstration. Click on the camera there, and there we go. So you'll see that this camera, in fact, does work with stop motion. So we'll create a quick stop motion video. Stay very, very still. Now move just a little bit. Whoa. Now a little bit more. And a bit more. And a bit more. <laughs> This is not the correct way to make a stop motion video, people. <laughs> there. Okay, so turn off the camera. And. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Okay, Jim, so that is the LifeCam Studio. You can find out more about the camera. Please go through my blog because, as I say, those links are tracked and, uh, and we do uh, get some credit uh, if you do purchase it. But that said, is, you know, I'm not endorsed in any way by Microsoft or anything like that. I just am looking for a deal myself, okay, so that we're able to pick up these cameras for 55 bucks and they're 1080p. Maybe you can't get 1080p, Jim, but if that's the case... As you saw there, even at 640 by 360, it's a good quality camera for the price. USB 2.0, so it's compatible with uh, most systems. It does require pretty uh, heavy specs, but it uh, does a really good job. And as you see there, it works on Linux. And uh, if you do anything with it, old guy Jim, you should send it in so we can see it. Because I actually, Absolutely. I went to school for animation, so we did stop motion animation cool. in school. So I would be interested in seeing something you made. Now, being that you went to school for animation, what, what kind of stuff did you get into? Be interested to learn a little bit more about what, what you've done. And we know that you do these amazing cartoons because you've seen the cartoons. You see it on our website right now if you go there, uh, the Valentine and things like that. 
Yeah, well, I worked on like 2D animation mm -hmm. and um, stop motion and flash animation. So, cool. yeah, it would be neat to see. I remember one time spending an entire day doing a bit of stop motion animation because it's 24 frames a second. So right, to do like yeah. a minute of video was took forever. And then at the very end, the teacher came and said, oh, no, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, do it again. So, <laughs> ah. Not good enough. Not good but enough. But if you like it, I recommend, I think his name is Jan Svenkenmeyer or something, made a movie called Alice. Now that is some weird stop motion animation. Check it out. Cool. Yeah, the stuff that I've done with stop motion, I mean, I, I think it's really, really neat, but I've only ever really tinkered with it. And we did a, a demonstration on the show in which, you know, literally, you know how much work it is to do 24 frames a second. So t to do a... a, a 10 second video in a in a 15 minute window is is tough <laughs> quality goes down the drain so uh well you can uh, you can actually send in your viewer questions uh go to uh your email application send us an email live at category 5.tv we would love to uh to field your question try to answer it right here live on the show your questions tonight are brought to you by Cordery Electric. They are the official electrical company of Category 5 Technology TV. Find out more about them uh, by contacting them, our Cordery at CorderyElectric.com. And, of course, they will, uh, they will take care of your electrical needs anywhere within 100 kilometers of Barrie, Ontario. So check them out. Cool. Could take a question in the chat room if there are any. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of minutes here uh, before we uh, jump into the news. So. Well, I was going to say, yeah. because I mentioned it earlier, so um, some people like the cartoons. Yeah. So if anyone has a cool cartoon idea related to Category 5 or the Rob or the co-host or whatever, something related to the show, send in your ideas. And if there's one I like, I will do it for you. And maybe Rob will show it on the show or whatever. Yeah, very cool. It's up cool. to you. So Now, we actually... Uh, Make it we funny. <laughs> For those of you who have perhaps not seen a, a Rachel Shu cartoon, uh, if you go to our photo gallery on our website, category5.tv, you can see some of them. Here's your happy Valentine's Day for today. And there we all are. And there are a couple in there. We had a Christmas one as well that, uh, that Rachel did. So yeah, great idea to uh, send in your ideas. You can email them to live at category5.tv and Rachel will receive that request. And uh, yeah, it's fun stuff. Cool. Nicely done. Nicely done. Um, so Broked Computer uh, has a question, if you mm -hmm. have time. He says, uh, do you know how to set up an Active Directory LDAP server? With the time that we have, as, as Invincible Mutant would say, I will direct you towards Turnkey Linux. Oh, is that like another nine-hour yeah, setup? Yeah, well, uh, uh, an Active Directory setup setting up a domain for your for your windows network can be deeply involved the the thing is is do you want to go with full active directory services with like a small business server from microsoft or something like that pay through the teeth for uh licensing just by itself let alone the software itself but licensing uh, t uh terminal user cals and things like that can cost a fortune instead we can actually fall back on linux based uh, Active Directory architecture. So if we go to Turnkey Linux, the reason that I recommend them is that it's already pre-built for you. It's really, really simple to get started out of the box. TurnkeyLinux.org. If we scroll down just a little bit, you'll start to find the appliances. There are a ton of pre-built virtual machine appliances. LAMP stack, for example, if you want to create a Linux, uh, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack to host websites. Joomla, WordPress, Redmine, etc., etc., and here's the one: Turnkey Domain Controller Appliance. That will, in fact, replace your need for a Windows primary domain controller by using Linux technology. So you're able to create the same environment for your Windows users, but it's free. So check it out: it's TurnkeyLinux.org, and that particular one is called the Domain Controller. All right, check that out. And that's all the time that we have today for viewer questions. Do stick around uh, because after the news, we are going to be jumping right into our tutorial about VirtualBox. Ooh. And certainly, if you're going to be getting into uh, appliances, which are virtual machines that you host on your computer, there's an opportunity for you to take the tutorial tonight 
and then grab one of those turnkey Linux uh, appliances and install it using what, what we're going to learn a little bit later on. So stick around. That's going to be a lot of fun. If you're ready, we will uh, yep. jump right into the news. Let's see what's what going on. exciting stuff is going on here. So the shares in technology giant Apple have crossed $500 a share for the first time. And it caps a remarkable turnaround for the iPhone maker, whose shares were worth just $3.19 in 1997 when it faced the possibility of bankruptcy. So if you were one of those people who got in at $3, <laughs> Oh the my. Money my way. Could you imagine? <laughs> That'd be insane. Send it Anybody? over here. So wow. it's now worth $460 billion, Apple is. Oh. And last month, Apple reported record breaking net profits for the last three months of 2011. Um, the profits were the fourth biggest in U.S. corporate history. Wish I had got in on that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Netflix has paid $9 million to settle a privacy-related legal action a financial filing has revealed. The online streaming firm, which made no omission of wrongdoing, said the settlement related to compliance with the Video Protection Privacy Act. Um, the 1988 U.S. legislation prohibits the disclosure of video rental histories, and it is reported that the legal action concerned allegations that Netflix was failing to delete the viewing histories of customers who had left the service. So Netflix has argued against parts of the 24-year-old legislation in the past since it prevents them from offering a Netflix Facebook app, which would allow U.S.-based users to share information on what they are watching with Facebook friends. Hmm. And uh, this settlement put a significant dent in Netflix's finances after accounting for the payment fourth quarter earnings fell from $40.7 million to $35.2 million. That's crazy. Aw, poor them. Well, only really, I mean, only 35 million. Yeah tough yeah I, I gotta agree i gotta admit though I'm, I'm a little bit on their side with regards to that i mean like what movie did you watch last week don't tell us because it's illegal <laughs> i mean it should be my choice if i tell people what movies i watched right i can understand how that legislation went into place but how many 24 years later internet is huge and people like to share stuff i was saying and it's not like the people that their histories were shown they're not the ones who got the nine million dollars most likely not yeah so it's who got it i should complain that uh that they kept my i want to share that i should go to the movie store and just say can you tell me what i rented last week and just see <laughs> if they say yes and then ah nine million dollars <laughs> It reminds uh, me, though, of uh, that just makes me think, not to digress, but um, you know how a lot of people on like Twitter or something, they have this plugin installed in their media player so that it says on Twitter what they're listening to. So I thought, wouldn't it be funny to go through all their MP3 library and, and redo all their ID3 tags? So like, no matter what Eric Kidd is listening to, it could be anything. And all of a sudden on his Twitter, he's listening to Justin Bieber's greatest hits. <laughs> Fantastic guy. <laughs> if you do it, I want a screenshot. Back to the news. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be good. Alrighty. President Barack Obama's 2013 budget request for NASA would slash spending on Mars exploration and shift funds to human space flight and space technology. So, hmm. guess you're not going to see my family after all. <laughs> And as reported by BBC News last week, this means the U.S. will pull the plug on its joint missions to Mars with Europe. If approved by Congress, the budget request would reduce funds available for planetary science by about 21%, but spending on human exploration and space technology would rise by 6% and 22%, respectively. So uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL rover, will land on the Red Planet this year, and the MAVEN mission to study the Martian atmosphere will still go ahead in 2013. So, responding to criticisms of swinging cuts to the Mars program, Mr. Bolden said, For someone to say we're walking away from Mars with the biggest rover, MSL, not even there yet, I don't think that makes much sense. Overall, NASA would receive about $17.7 billion for next year, with a fat budget envisioned over the next few years. Okay. Hmm. Anyone got thoughts? Well, my only thought is, like... It, it's 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 so tough to get to Mars. I I'm so hopeful. I mean, I'm a Trek guy, right? So I'm like you're hoping Captain Picard's going to be like. Ee. Yeah, it would be nice if it was Captain Picard. Klingons. But 
I don't know so much about Klingons because probably at this time and step in the game they'd be at war with us. Tribbles. So. Tribbles. My kids would love a couple thousand tribbles. Man eating pickles. That I have not seen. What's It seems like it's never going to happen though. It seems like it's never going to happen. Like space flight, and it's like they're talking about going to space, and it's like we're going to get just outside of the atmosphere. Oh. Want to go to Mars? <laughs> Okay, then. Um, Microsoft appears to have had its Indian web store broken into and user login credentials stolen by Chinese hackers. Hmm. And that wasn't me. And uh, tech site WebPSauce reported on Sunday that the program group, which goes by the name Evil Shadow Team, managed to deface the website, posting an image of a V for Vendetta mask with the message, Unsafe System Will Be Baptized. (laughs) Even now, as you can see in this image... The site continues to be offline with a slightly more official looking message. According to multiple reports, user logins and the passwords were also stolen by the hackers, a situation made significantly worse because Quasar apparently made the schoolboy error of storing them in plain text. Oh, seriously? Great. That looks good on Microsoft. Not. (laughs) So, users of Microsoft Store in India are being advised to change their passwords on the site as soon as it comes back online, to change their credentials on any other sites if they use the same ones across multiple online accounts. And so, if you want the full stories, go to category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category 5 TV newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. For the Category 5 TV newsroom... I am Rachel Shu. Thank you, Rachel. The news tonight is brought to you by GardengateFarms.com. Certified organic broccoli sprout and wheatgrass juice. You can check them out online, GardengateFarms.com. Also, Planet Calypso. Get the free online massive multiplayer role-playing game at cat5.tv slash calypso. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for joining us on the show tonight. And you can find our website at www.category5.tv. There you go. We also, again, have the mobile site, mobile.cat5.tv. We'd love to uh, have you join us there or on our website. Cool stuff. Are you familiar with virtualization? Okay. One of the things that I really hope to accomplish with Category 5 TV, and I think that we, we kind of do this, is to be able to offer you ways to save money by using technology to your advantage. And one of the coolest things in business, and even as a home user that that have come along in a long time, is is something called virtualization. It basically means I can be running Linux, but then if I do need Windows, say for Photoshop or something like that, I can boot up Windows inside of Linux as if it was a program. So now all of a sudden I've got my Windows environment, I can create my virtual machine as it's called, and within that environment I can install my accounting software that's Windows only even though technically I'm running Linux because virtualization lets me do that. lets you very quickly switch between different operating systems because it's a virtualized environment. It treats your Windows installation as if it was another program installed on your computer. So you can tab, you know, switch over to Linux instantly and surf the web or whatever a lot safer. So with virtualization in, the, in, in a business environment, of course, what that means for you uh, is that you're able to create virtual servers we were looking a little bit earlier tonight about uh, at turnkey Linux appliances where you can replace an entire domain controller. Well, imagine, you know, if we go back 10 years in time, we'd have a server which would be way oversized, way overpriced, very expensive to repair if anything ever goes wrong with it because it's all proprietary. And each server would run one, one task, really. You'd have a domain controller server. That server was one physical unit. If you wanted to have exchange mailboxes, quite often systems weren't powerful enough to carry both tasks, so you'd have to run that on a separate server. Then you'd have a file server for FTP and, and Samba, things like that. So you end up with a whole bunch of servers in your corporate environment. Well, now we can take that. We get one basically super powerful computer which is much smaller than they ever used to be and in that computer we can install a whole bunch of virtual computers literally is like having a whole bunch of computers installed in one computer so we start off as with linux as our base because that's you know the most stable the most uh virus uh uh immune 
I guess would be the word. We don't have to deal with Windows viruses, of course, because it's Linux. So starting with Linux as our base, we can then install uh, a, a turnkey Linux appliance for our domain controller. We can install a Windows XP system to be able to run our Photoshop and whatever else. Uh, we can install a, a whole bunch of different systems, and they can run simultaneously as long as you've got enough RAM. So if you want to give each machine, say, 4 gigs of RAM, and you've got 16 gigs in your system, well, no problem. You've got enough to run at least two or three virtual machines simultaneously. Chances are you're only going to, unless it's a server, you're only going to need to run, run one or two. So tonight what I want to show you is how to create basically the ultimate server-based environment. We're talking about a headless, a headless virtual box setup. Very cool stuff. Again, if you're in business, or let's say you're, I, I love the example of things like uh, nonprofits or churches, charities, and things like that, where you really need to be able to save money. Um, so here's an opportunity for you to do that by using a, a pretty good PC. So. Mm. Oh, I'm just writing notes for myself. Okay. All right. Eric does this thing where he scratches something down and then he goes. <laughs> Subtle. <laughs> yeah. Subtle. Subtle. So. So tonight, okay, so imagine, okay, we've got a system that's built to be a virtualization server, okay? So it's going to house uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. So that system may have a little, you know, fairly good amount of RAM, but we want to stick it in a corner somewhere in a server room. We want it to be on a UPS so it's got battery backup and it's going to be doing its thing. And we can use remote desktop or VNC or any of those kinds of things in order to access them. But we don't want to have to stand in front of the server because these days you don't need to. I can administer a server way down in California from up here in Barrie. I can take care of everything for you remotely without ever having to stand in front of the server. And that's what virtualization gives us in the real world environment. So a couple of tools that you really need. One of them is called VirtualBox. I already have VirtualBox installed on this system. VirtualBox is a free piece of software which allows you to basically, you'll see here that and these errors are just because of some of the virtual machines that I have are, are just, you know, are, have been deleted or whatever. But you see, yeah, like I've got Windows 7 installed. I've got Ubuntu 11.10, Linux Mint, Debian, Kimo, and I've got uh, my website. All these things are virtual machines on my system, so I could boot up any one of those. Very cool stuff. But what I want to do, you know, I still, again, I have to sit here in front of a computer. So I'm not going to take you step by step through installing Linux and things like that. What you're going to need is basically Linux. We're going to need Apache, which you can install. You know, if you've got Debian or, pardon me, Ubuntu, I'm using Zorin OS. Just install the PHP 5 meta package. Go into Synaptic Package Manager, go to PHP 5, and just install that. That's going to give you Apache and PHP. That's all we need today. Um, or you can go into your terminal and type sudo uh, apt dash get space PHP 5 all one word PHP, the number five. That's going to install that for you. With PHP 5, that again gives you Apache. What that means is my computer, or in this case, say my server, okay, is going to become a bit of a server. It becomes a web server. That file is in fact, so what you're seeing there where it says it works, I'm going to go var www. There's a file called index.php in this folder. If I open that, You'll see exactly what that file is, right? I've added a mail script there to test it, but it says it works, okay? So that's all that is, brilliant. Okay, so that's Apache. That's what we're gonna need. Okay, so we've got VirtualBox installed. Let's get rocking on this. I'm gonna close VirtualBox because what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an entire server environment to allow you to administer this thing through your web browser from anywhere on your LAN or you can open up a port on your firewall and you'll be able to administer it remotely as well. First things first, we need a Linux user in order to, uh, in, in order to basically run VirtualBox. I'm gonna create a new user Linux users for me and for you probably are going to be under system, administration, users, and groups. Okay, create a new user. I'm going to call this one uh, VBox. All right, just to make it nice and easy, and I know exactly what that is. It's going to be my virtual box user. I'm going to hit OK. Not a lot of stuff has to happen to that user because really they're just to authenticate. I'm going to call my password 1234 1234 1234 1234. I would never set a password to that. 
We're going to do that just for the demonstration because, you know, we're not going to create a big, strong password on the show, and then I'm going to sit here wondering, you know, oh, what did I set it as? So for you, I want you to use something that's uppercase, lowercase, alphanumeric. It's got a couple of characters in it that, you know, are like a, an at symbol or an uh, explanation point or commas or whatever else uh, so that it's nice and strong so people can't guess at it, okay? So in the meantime, we're going to go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay. My VBox user is created. I'm ready to go. Close out of that. Now I'm going to go into, well, let's bring up my web browser first and foremost, and let's actually get a copy of the tool that we're going to need. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create for you a, a nice little link, cat5.tv slash VB. All right? Stands for virtual box, if you ever need to remember that. Cat5.tv slash VB. When you click on that, right now where that's going to take me is directly to the downloads for PHP VirtualBox and I'm going to get the newest version look at the date over on the right there 4.1.7 at the time of this and I'm going to download that super small click on it and open it there it is okay I'm going to extract that to my temp folder slash TMP here we are in Linux doing all this and then I'm going to close this okay so now I have a copy of this PHP VirtualBox in the temp folder on my computer. Let's go into our terminal. And I'm going to go into cd slash tmp and then go cd space. And it was called php. And then I hit tab to fill in the rest so I don't have to type the whole thing and hit enter. Now if I do an ls, which shows me a directory listing, there's all the files. So now I need to go. We remember where, do you remember where the, uh, the files are located for our website? A little quiz for you slash var slash www with the default installation of Apache PHP 5 under uh, this particular environment which is based on Ubuntu. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sudo because you have to be a super user and of course if you're using Debian you'll just do a su to become root and then you'll be able to uh, do just make dir. Make dir var www slash and I'm going to call it vb or I can call it virtualbox or I can call it whatever I want. I'm just going to create that folder enter my password and there we go so now I've created a folder in www called VB so now if I go localhost slash VB it's gonna take me to that folder so now what I want to do is sudo MV star slash var slash www slash VB slash remember that trailing back uh, that slash what that's gonna do is just gonna move all the files so now if I do an LS the folders empty but if I do an LS on this folder that's where the files have been moved to. Next step, we need to actually configure VirtualBox because what's cool about VirtualBox 2 is that it comes with a SOAP server program that allows API uh, application programming interfaces to interact directly with VirtualBox with, with no uh, GUI. So very cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to set that up. This is so simple. All we need to do is go sudo gedit. Okay, we need to create a file which probably doesn't exist. But we're going to go default, so slash etc, slash default, slash virtual box. So what we're doing is we're going sudo to become a super user. We're going gedit to open our text editor. And then we're telling it what file we want to bring up into text editor. It's slash etc, slash default, slash virtual box. Do not leave out this step because if you do, you are not going to be able to start the soap daemon that is going to allow you to run your web server. And you're going to get errors and you're going to wonder what is going on. You have to take this step, okay? Because what we're going to do with this file is we're going to tell this system, we're going to tell VirtualBox th who the user is that has auth authority to do this. And we already created that user. So VBox web underscore user equals VBox, because that's the user we created. If we wanted to, I could run it as Robbie. Whatever. But we created a user specifically for VirtualBox. Makes backing up really simple. I'm going to save that file. If you have trouble saving, you probably forgot to do sudo. There we go. VBox web underscore user equals vbox. That's all you need. Exit that. Okay. Those errors there, don't worry about it. That's just gedit. It's nothing fancy. Now I'm going to try this. I'm going to go... Now Notice I started typing e etc. I forgot. I need sudo slash etc slash init dot d slash vbox. Here's the cool feature. vbox web dash service and we're going to go start. Okay. Hit enter says done. That means it worked. There were no errors. If I do that again, I hit up and I go status. It says 
checking for VBox web service, running. Okay? That's what we need to get to. That's the point that we need to be at in order to make this thing work. I feel like the slap chop guy. Are you following me so far? Are you following me? <laughs> Come on, camera guy. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Next step. We're going to make this thing actually go. All right. Here we go. So easy. So easy. Just follow the steps. Okay. I'm going to go cd slash var slash www slash vb. That's the folder where my files are. This is the program that's going to let me do this all through my browser. See how there's a config.php-example? We're going to move that mv. Sorry, we need sudo, don't we? mv config.php-example. Notice I just hit tab and it did that. Now I'm just going to rename it config.php. So I'm saying move, but really what I've done is I've renamed it. So now there's a config.php file instead. So now I'm going to go sudo gedit config.php so that we can set up our, our user. Oh, look at that. The user was already called vbox, but you're going to need to put your username in there. It could be Robbie, right? We're going to go vbox. Do you remember my ultra hard password? There we go. Okay. You're going to need to set that up. Other than that, you can probably leave all the other settings the way they are. If you want to get really hardcore into this, you can go through the settings there and really customize things. But in this case, because it's the first time we've done it, let's just leave everything else the way it is. We've set up our user. We're ready to go. So now, I'm going to close that. I'm going to close everything up, and let's bring up my web browser. Again, remember, I've got PHP 5 installed, which has Apache, so I've got localhost, right? But now, I've got localhost slash VB. See what we've created? Now I'm going to go and username is admin, password is admin. Okay? If we've done this right, I hit log in, and that is what I'm seeing in my actual web browser. Right? Looks strikingly like VirtualBox. Check this out. Okay. First things first, my friends, admin, admin is not secure. Let's go file, change password, old password, admin. New password, of course, our super secure password, 1234, 1234, 1234, 1234. That's going to be your super secure password. Okay, that's the first thing I want to do. Now, look at this. If I click on VirtualBox there, it tells me about the running instance of VirtualBox. Remember, I started slash etc slash init.d slash vbox web dash service. I started that service, and that's what this is now allowed to connect to because I set up the user credentials for that VBox user. Okay, So now, let's create a new virtual machine, just as if I was actually in VirtualBox. Next, name of my virtual machine. Now, can I remind you here, I'm in my web browser. This is Chrome. I'm not running VirtualBox now. I could be on any computer on my network. You could bring it up. You could go to my IP address slash VB, and you'd be able to access this interface as well, anyone on your network. But remember, that's why we have that secure password. Okay. You can open it up to the, f the firewall port 80 if you want. Okay. But again, it's, it's safe in that it is, it's set up with a password, All right, and it's as secure as you set it up to be. Watch your firewall, though. We want to we're not going to get into security issues at this point. We're going to do this all in the LAN for now. I'm going to call this my Windows system. We'll call this Windows 7. So users want, wanting to install Microsoft Windows version 7, okay, 32-bit, let's say, and then we hit Next. And we tell it, how much memory do you want? And you'll see this is exactly like VirtualBox. What do you want to do? Create a new hard disk. These are virtual hard disks. You don't have to worry about formatting them. They're not going to touch your actual host operating system, okay? And you follow the prompts just like you were setting up a real virtual machine in VirtualBox. It's, it's done and done. So now I have a machine for Windows 7. All I need to do is go into Settings, go into Storage, and grab where my CD is, right? Choose a virtual CD disk, disk image file, and I can use an ISO. Or I can use my actual CD drive and install my, my system that way. So here's what's really neat. Now, we don't have any virtual machines installed yet. I'm going to tell you something real quick, because some of you may have noticed that now that I've run this VirtualBox instance, you'll notice, well, where did Robbie's machines go? He used to have Windows 7, Ubuntu 11.10. Where did all those go? Remember that those were under the Robbie user. Okay. Now, I've created a new user called VBox, and that is the user that's now running this program 
in the background, headless. I don't need a monitor anymore on that computer because I'll use my web browser from any other computer. I use the web browser from a tablet, right? So if I want access to those machines, I can move them over, I can copy them over, I can create sim links or whatever I need to do. But in this case, we're starting with a fresh install. We, we're going to create new virtual machines. If you want to grab a, a Linux appliance, you can install those as well. You've got an option here up at the top. So this is for, for you if you're looking at that turnkey. You can go import appliance, right? Or alternatively, what I usually do is I'll just create a new virtual machine and I, download, I prefer to download the ISO and just go through a full install. It's very quick with turnkey. So, so that is how we create the ultimate VirtualBox setup. Of course, this just, gi it just gives us so much freedom. It is browser-based. We no longer have to have a head on our VirtualBox machine. It now takes VirtualBox to the server platform in such a way that VMware was the way to go in previous years. So now if you run a server, if you're an administrator, an IT director, anything at all, anywhere that where you're dealing with virtualization and needing to cut costs, needing to uh, use hardware to its full power, because remember, these days your computers are so incredibly powerful. I bring up my system monitor here, right? And I've got this is just my this is just my demo system and my CPU is running like 20% usage, 10%, 2% usage. So what what a waste of resources if I'm just running one operating system. Now with virtualization I can run multiple operating systems and in a server that is a fantastic way to cut costs. And it's virtual hardware. If your real hardware crashes, take the backup of that virtual machine, move it onto another server, move it onto a laptop. Just install VirtualBox. It's free. VirtualBox.org. And then you can move that virtual appliance, that virtual machine, anywhere. You can store it on your network and boot it up from any computer. It's fantastic. So many good things to be said about virtualization. And VirtualBox has now entered that server realm. We're no longer just for the desktop. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and we're online at www.category5.tv. Uh, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, I would expect that there may be some questions in the chat room. We've got a couple minutes here to, to field those. Well, actually, um, Invisible Mutant had a question, but mm -hmm. it was way back in the list. So oh. if you still have it, do you want to repost it, Invisible Mutant? I don't remember. It was like, wee, wee, wee. Let me see. I think. Um, do -do. I can't remember what minute it was at. But he had a question somewhere in there. Can we allow multi-users? No, I think it was a different one than that. All right. I have uh, guest editions and USB extensions. Oh, here. Robbie F., if you have time at the end of the show, is it possible to discuss a bit about SSD card? Well, what would you like to know about an SSD? That's a, a solid-state hard drive. Let us know what you'd like to know. I'd, I'd be happy to to talk to you but let's let's try if if there if there are questions specifically about VirtualBox and how this technology can be used I'd love to uh, to to stay on track with that just so that it's it's kind of all here as a resource but uh, you'd like to upgrade to SSD SSD in order to get the same you know you hear that they're faster they're possibly more reliable they're not sensitive to shock factors and things like that if you put an SSD in a laptop and it gets jostled chances are it's gonna still boot up if you have a spinning hard drive in there and it gets jostled pretty hard it's gonna damage the drive and you're gonna lose data so so there are advantages there as far as cost to gigabyte um, goes you're gonna pay through the teeth right now for uh, for any really f gigabyte to gigabyte you're going to pay more but then again I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to see um, because the price of hard drives spinning hard drives goes up and up and up after the flooding we're going to see that gap kind of closing in on itself in such a way that SSD is going to be the way to go but that said there's there are many options there I'm a Kingston guy myself but there are some uh, tons and tons of good stuff out there um, so uh, what you what you want to do is look out for the, for the speed is really crucial and not to plug crucial but that's the real thing get into forums ssd is very finicky as far as it's not night and day it's not black and white anymore right hard drives used to be able to say ah, 7200 rpm great that's pretty fast 10,000 rpm that's even faster great put it in a raid zero and it's even faster well with a with a, an ssd you've got to look at reviews because it, it works very very differently what's up 
Uh, Agamotto says, ask Robbie which controller set you should go for. That changes from week to week, right? So get into the forums, get, get asking some questions, get reviewing. Get onto sites like Amazon are great because you get people who, uh, who usually, I mean, people who review stuff are the people who are disgruntled. So if you want to know what's wrong with something, get onto Amazon and look at people who have bought it. And you'll probably see a bunch of people who have said some negative things. So you can you can weigh the good with the bad and weigh who really knows what they're talking about and can say in technical terms, so to speak, that you know this particular drive has this issue or whatever. But it is very, very different than spinning drives. So we don't have time to get right into SSD right now. I'm sorry. But if you uh, want to know more, email me live at category5.tv and we will talk about it on a future show. But that is all the time that we have tonight. Yep. How's the cake? You didn't give me a fork. I've been like... You're supposed to just... Ow! Ow! <laughs> Seriously. Fork. That's the way to do it. Alrighty. All right. Have nice a great here. night, everybody. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Take care. We will okay. see you next week. Uh, Hillary Rumble is going to be here. So uh, we will talk to you next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, 4 o'clock Pacific. And we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.